new ballot box up there for them. And I'm trying to get to a location where I can pull off the side of the road here in a little bit. But uh, from what I understand, basically what we want to talk about is the election process from beginning to end. And most of you know <clears throat> that this isn't something that just overnight, you know, ballots are created and sent out. The process actually starts way, way in advance. It really starts about May, middle of May, with candidate filing week. Candidate filing week is when somebody chooses to throw their hat in the ring and run for office. And they pay their candidate filing fees and everything, and they uh, move on to what happens in the auditor's office is we collect all the data, we collect all the candidates' information, uh, we start creating ballots. We start creating the ballots in our system at that point, and we send that to our printers. Now, this is usually about a two to three week process from candidate filing to ballot creation. We're also coordinating with the candidates to get photos and statements. Uh, some candidates choose to not send photos or statements. So if you're looking on our website, at the voters pamphlet and you don't see anything listed, it's because the candidate chose not to respond or chose not to send anything in. Um, we don't create the statements for them or anything. It's up to the candidate to get you that information. So now time has gone on, ballots are printed, they're sitting in our mail house, ready to go out. And 18 days before the election is what we're required to send ballots out. Uh, Grace Harbor County, on average, we send ours about 20, 20 to 22 days in advance of the election. And that way you have them for a good three weeks, almost three weeks, um, to be able to vote those and send them back into us. And during this time, what is happening, you have some people that will turn their ballots in immediately upon receipt. You have some people that will wait till the end. Uh, maybe they're researching candidates or maybe they're waiting to see if any big breaking news comes out. The one thing I will say is when you turn a ballot in early, uh, it goes through processing a lot smoother one of the things that we've had in Grace Harbor County since I've been in office is about 50% of our ballots that are turned in are turned in on election day. The downfall with that is it delays the ability for us to process them because when we get 10, say 10,000 ballots in on one day, well, it's still a manual process, even though we do have machines that assist us in some parts, but the machines do not pull the envelope ballots out of the envelope. Machines don't check the signatures. We don't have any of that. So it is still a manual process and it takes a little bit to get through that process. So I always encourage everybody to return their ballot as soon as they can, as soon as they get it, put it in a drop box, put it in the mail, bring it into my office. As you, most of you are aware, we have installed a new ballot box for you guys in McCleary. Uh, we've added four new ballot boxes in the last three months, one in McCleary, one in Cosmopolis, one in Aberdeen, and today I just put one in in Tahola, um, which worked out perfect because their ballots were, they, I got confirmation from one of the people up there that they received their ballot in the mail today. So you should be seeing yours today also. So now what's the next step? Well, basically it's a waiting game. Um, one thing that you can do between now and election day is you can go to voter.votelaw.gov. You're gonna put in your first name, your last name and your date of birth. Once you're in there, you'll be able to look at your voters pamphlet, who's your elected official, you'll be able to check your ballot status. Um, so if you mail your ballot in today, 
give it three to four days and just make sure that we received it. Uh, you'll also be able to see that your ballot was accepted and uh, sent for processing on there. Now, you won't be able to tell how, you know, how your ballot was counted, obviously, because that's still a uh, voter secrecy issue. Um, but we'll be able to see that your ballot is being counted. So now that's during the election. If you find that you don't have all that information, that, uh, or if you don't find that information out on the website, give us a call. Um, you know, it could be easily explainable. It could be that it was in a ballot box and it didn't get picked up immediately. Or it could be that it was lost. Um, and if that's the case, we can always give you a replacement ballot. That's one of the nice things about vote by mail, where we are, uh, where we send the ballots out so early you're able to check on the status of your ballot and get a replacement ballot. Or if you didn't receive one to begin with, we're always able to replace, give you a replacement ballot at any time. Um, a ballot is just a blank form until it has a signature on it. So, you know, be sure to get your ballot and get it. We've gone through the election process and now we're coming up on election day and what happens there? Well, on throughout the course of the election, we're doing all the pre-processing and the signature check, the separation, flattening the ballots. Uh, we scan them into the digital system. And hopefully that's not in the way. Hopefully uh, we scan them into the system, but we cannot see what the, to what the vote totals are until 8 p.m. on election night. At 8 p.m. on election night, we transfer all the data from one location, uh, from one computer system to another computer system to consolidate the vote totals to actually see how people voted, or not see how people voted, to see what the vote totals were of the ballots that have been counted and processed. Um, Neither one of these systems, the pre-processing system and the tabulation system, neither one of those systems are on a, net, a, a Wi-Fi network or on a computer network of any kind. They are air-gapped um, to secure the, secure the election system to prevent hacking and everything. So that's one thing we don't have to worry about in Washington State is none of our systems are connected to the internet. Um, now, on election night, we will have preliminary results. Every three days, every three days following election, as long as we have more than 500 ballots to account, we will be updating numbers every three days. So the first day that we will update numbers after the uh, election night will be the coming Friday. Now, it is three business days. The third business day is Friday. And during that time, ballots that have come in in the mail the next day, ballots that have come in from ballot deposit sites, drop boxes, those that have gone through the signature verification, the opening boards and everything will be processed and released. Now, this year is a presidential presidential election year. It's probably been one of the most viewed elections I've ever seen in my life. It's the most, historically speaking, I believe we are going to break every voting record ever known. I'm anticipating at, um, at least a 90% turnout this election. 85 to 90% is what I'm anticipating. In turn, that means a lot of ballots that we're gonna be processing. At which point, it could be um, seven to 10 days after the election that we are, seven to 10 business days that we are still processing ballots and coming up with totals. 
hopefully that's not the case. I'm hoping that most of the ballots are returned earlier and we're able to pre-process everything prior to election day and have a lot less to do after the election. So we've made it through the whole course of the election from candidate filing to election day, but obviously that's not the end of it. 21 days after the general election is when we certify the election. And that's the, technically that is the official results of the election. We will have preliminary results for you on election night, three days following on that Friday, another three days, which would be the Wednesday, uh, we'll have more results. Um, and then we'll have just some cleanup ballots after that. <clears throat> the cleanup ballots are going to be our no match signatures. So if your voter registration is different than the signature on your ballot, that is what we call a challenged signature, at which point you're going to be mailed the letter. And on that letter, there's a form, a form that you have to fill out and send back to us. And basically what you're doing is you're signing an oath stating that you voted that ballot. That is my signature. Please count my ballot. Um, once you send that back into us, we compare the signatures, we update the signature on record, and we count your ballot as long as you sign that oath. Now, if you didn't sign your ballot, you forgot to sign the ballot envelope when you turned it in, we're, you're also going to get the same type of letter, and you just have to sign the oath and send it in so we can count your ballot. A lot of people send theirs in. There are quite a few that don't also, um, but it's your choice. And you have up till the day before certification, which is 20 days after the election is certified to turn that form in to be able to have it counted on ele uh, before certification of the election. So at this point, the canvassing board which is made up of the auditor, the uh, chair of the county commissioners, and the prosecuting attorney in the county um, will meet, and the canvassing board will go through any no match signatures, no signatures, late postmarks, late returns, or any ballots where voter intent was not able to be determined during the processing. The canvassing board will be presented with the with these ballots and they have the final say in whether these ballots are to be um, rejected or accepted. At that point, if they are accepted, the county ad uh, elections administrator will take those ballots that are accepted and process them. <clears throat> And then you will have the final results of the election after certification. What's following that? The only thing following is I'm gonna mail out certificates to each of the candidates who received the most amount of votes during the course of the election. And when I say I'm gonna send certificates, it's only to our local candidates. I'm not gonna send a certificate to the legislators, that's the state responsibility and the president and that. Um, but any of the candidates like our candidates for county commissioner, fire district, school districts, city councils will receive a certificate and an oath of office form uh, from my office. And that pretty much concludes that election. The only thing that we have left is, uh, being that this is a federal election, we have to hold these ballots for 22 months, almost two years. Uh, we just uh, hit the 22 month mark on our 2018 election. So just as it's time to start the 2020 election, general election, we are actually able to, um, to destroy based on destroy the 2018 election materials based off of the records retention schedule that's listed in state law. So 
we've gone through the whole process of the election from candidate filing week clear to the certification and election destruction of an election. Um, so I'm going to open it up now for any questions. If anybody has any questions that they would like to have answered, uh, feel free to bring those forward. And so what I can do is unmute you guys if you have a question, just raise your hand. <laughs> um, it looks like Andrea posted, on average, what is the voting rate of Grays Harbor County? On average, I would say the average voting rate of Grays Harbor County is probably 40 to 50 percent, depending on the election cycle. Um, your, your real small, like, School district elections we in February, we may only see 30 to 35 percent, primaries 35 to 40 percent, generals maybe right around 40 to 50 percent. Uh, but when it comes to a presidential year, we always have a lot more involvement locally. And our general, our typical presidential year, we'd see 60 to 70 percent turnout well, actually not even that much, up to about 60% turnout. In 2016, we almost broke the record that was set back during the Vietnam era for voter turnout at 72%, I think it was, right around that area. It was in the 70 percentile. This year, we're expecting anywhere from 85 to 90% turnout. And kind of how does that compare to other counties then if we if you control for population? Uh, when you look at the population, I mean, percentage wise, they pretty much run fairly close to each other. You have certain counties and usually it's a lot smaller counties like Ponderay or Wakayakum. They will have 70 to 80 percent voter turnout um, on average. And it's just it depends on the population. Um, one of the things that I have seen in my career is we're, with the implementation of automatic voter registration, if you get an enhanced ID, um, different things like that, I do find that our voter rolls are going up, but voter turnout is staying about the same. Um, so it always comes back for me, it always comes back. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Um, and it's really up to each individual to realize this is their right to make the decisions on how their county, their city, their state is run and who's in charge of doing that. And that's my main thing is I want to make sure that no matter who you are, what your beliefs are, get out and vote because it's you that's going to make the difference. And if you say that my vote don't count, so I don't vote, you're right. Your vote doesn't count if you don't vote. And there's a lot of elections that come down to one, two, or three votes. And if one person or three people turned in that, those ballots, it could change the results. Uh, last year, we had an Ocean Shores race that was three votes different. Mm -hmm. The mayor's race in Ocean Shores. It came down to three votes. I've seen um, elections that came down to one vote. Matter of fact, actually, the same exact election, Oakville, the current mayor won by one vote. Um, because of the way the recount standards are and everything, uh, in Oakville, because of the population, the one vote did not meet the one half of 1% mandatory recount. But Ocean Shores, being three votes different, made, made it to the one quarter of 1% recount range, which meant that we had to do a hand recount of all the ballots. And so with the installation of ballot boxes, does that correspond then to an increase of voting within the local community? Um, no, there's actually a state law that requires that we have ballot boxes in all the municipalities. And it's something that since I was elected into office, I've been working on. And I finally today, uh, as of two weeks ago, the last municipality was installed, which was Aberdeen. Um, so it, it's taken me almost 
almost a two years to get it done, but we got Cosmopolis, McCleary, and Aberdeen installed, which were the last three municipalities in Grays Harbor County that did not have a uh, ballot box. Now, the Quinault Indian Reservation, two years ago, they passed a law for the Native, Vot Native American Voting Rights Act that required us to install a box if they requested one. They requested one, three weeks later, we had it installed. So now we have all the municipalities covered and the Quinault Indian Reservation covered. And uh, I've got a couple extra boxes just in case I need to replace any, so. All right, so um, someone on Artist has a question. Artist asked, if it takes 21 days to finalize, where's my backup? Um, so if it takes 21 days to finalize, I am sure there are many other places that is the same. How can they claim when so fast? That's a great question. Uh, and you're talking about the presidential election, uh, which is presidential elections are, are a lot different. Uh, usually, but if I were to take it, take that down to a county commissioner race. So in a county commissioner race, Let's say that one person has a thousand more votes than the other person does, but there's only 900 ballots to count. There's no way that that race could change no matter how those ballots come in. It's just going to show the, act, the final numbers. In the presidential election, it is based on... Um, <clears throat> It, it's based off of the, uh, boy, that just left my mind. Electoral the electoral college. The yeah. electoral college. It is based off of the electoral college. And depending on which state you live in will depend on which how many delegates you have. Uh, Washington state, I believe, has 12, but like California has like 55 delegates. Now, if you win in Washington state, you're receiving all of the delegates. But then if you win in, let's say, I'm gonna say Minnesota, but I'm not sure if this is correct. Um, some states will divvy up their electorates based off the results of the population. Some states will give all delegates to the winner. So depending on which states it is, if you know, like if you took California and you received all the delegates in California, there's 55 votes for that. And then you get Washington, there's another 12. <clears throat> so what happens is with the time differences, when New York starts releasing their results and it works across the state, if somebody in somebody running for president has gathered up enough delegates, then they automatically would be denounced the win or they'd denounce the winner because they've overcome this the fifty percent margin of how many delegates it needs to move forward. Sorry, still getting the hang of Zoom. <laughs> um, Not a problem. No problem. <laughs> Let's see, what's the next question here? Um, so what was the first year Washington State began mail-in voting? I am assuming we have gotten better at the pro at processing them. Has the process changed much in that time? The process has changed a lot over the years. So I got into elections in 2007, and we were already doing mail-in voting uh, when I was in there. Now, the Washington state didn't officially go completely mail-in voting until 2014, 13 or 14, was the last year that Pierce County still had poll sites. Um, and in 2014, they removed the poll sites. 
And if I recall correctly, they were uh, reporting that maybe two to three people were voting at the poll sites and everybody else was voting absentee ballots. Now, we've been permanent absentee for quite some time, almost 20 years now, and the permanent absentee and vote by mail are basically the same thing, and we've had to work through quite a few different things. Now, we created a law back in, I want to say it was like 2003, 2004, allowing for permanent absentee ballots at which point was, is what started the process for us to do mail-in voting. And in 2008, oh, there was a hundred and, I wanna say it was 117 law changes in Washington state to accommodate mail-in voting. Since then, the most I've seen is like 40 law changes in one year. Uh, now we're lucky to see maybe one or two law changes and usually they're clarification law changes and process changes and to allow for new technology. Um, the process that we've gone through over the past, I'm gonna say 20 years, has led us to be the leader in the United States for vote by mail. Washington State is nationally recognized as the leader of vote by mail. Yay, Washington. <laughs> yes, yay, Washington. So, uh, Chris from Montezuma says, have we had any contested elections in Grays Harbor? Contested elections? Well, almost every election is contested. Uh, so, it depends on what you're what you're con, uh, referring to as a contested election. Uh, in my mind, a contested election is two candidates fighting it out till the end. Uh, if you're talking about a contested election as a court case, um, none that I can recall except for until you go back to you know Dino Rossi and Greg Wire. But that was a statewide race. Uh, we have had a few recounts, which would be kind of a contested issue. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we had the Ocean Shores recount. Uh, and a matter of fact, during my race in the primary, there was a recount between the second place and third place positions in the auditor's race in 2018. Um, but, you know, it depends on what your terminology of contested really is. I, I haven't seen any court cases come up against any of the candidates that have been elected in Grace Harbor. Chris, did you wanna expand on your question at all or did that answer it? I think you have to unmute yourself. I won't let me unmute you. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that was what I meant. Um, I was, uh, was kind of driving at the confidence that people have in mail-in voting. And it looks like people are generally really confident in the outcomes of, of the, of yeah. the uh, mail-in voting yeah. process. Okay. Yeah, it, it, one of the things with mail-in voting, you know, if we were to get into security of mail-in voting versus poll site um, and accessibility, Mail-in voting is a lot more secure than poll sites, and it's a lot more accessible for our disability communities and for our military and overseas citizens. Um, with poll sites, one of the things that you run into is you don't have as much control over how many ballots one person is handed. Um, We've seen it many times where if somebody goes up to a poll site, they might get handed one or two ballots, um, you know, and then there's a lot of times one of the things that comes up is a lot of the states that do poll sites, they don't report who was unable to receive a ballot. So if you showed up at the wrong poll site and couldn't get a ballot, that's not reported where in Washington state it is. So we have really accurate numbers in Washington state about rejection rates and things like that. 
where in other states you have no reports because they're just turned away. They're not actually allowed to vote. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so someone commented, it kind of makes the people in Washington state feel like our vote doesn't count. I think that's in reference to um, nationally. Is that, is that what you mean, Alicia? I, I would assume that uh, that would be in reference to the president race. Um, your vote does count. Um, if, you know, every elector, the electorate goes to the winner. So the less electorates one has, the less chance they have of winning the race. So even though they're calling the election prior to it, making it to Washington, if it was tied when it got to us, we might be the tiebreaker, you know, and, and it's the electoral college was something that was set up in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, <clears throat> and what it was designed for is to give every state equal voice. So they based it off of how many congressional districts you have and or yeah, congressional districts. And depending on the census and vote uh, vote and population, it it's to give smaller states with less uh, with less people uh, the same voice as a bigger state in 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 comparison to uh, how the vote goes. So and that's what it was originally designed for. That's the best uh, explanation I can give of it. But if it gets down to where all of the states on the East Coast, if we had a 50-50 tie all the way across, once it got to Washington State, uh, Oregon, California, Nevada, once it got to us, we would be the tiebreakers. Um, let's see. I think you said each ballot is counted manually. Can you describe that process? Is our signatures on a database where they access our name and compare them? Yes. So your signature is tied to your voter registration record. And the manual process of that, uh, it used to be that we would have your ballot envelope here. And then over here, we'd have the computer screen that showed the signature on file for you. And we would compare the envelope to the signature. Now, we have just installed a new sorting machine as of about three weeks ago. The sorting machine, <clears throat> basically what it does, is it's a fancy word for a, a bundler. It bundle, it counts how many envelopes there are and puts them into groups of like 300 or 50 or how, whatever we set it at and creates what we call a batch. It also takes a picture of the envelope and then that, it, it, that picture is imported into our system, the voter registration system and then it'll bring up both images side by side on screen versus having an envelope and a monitor's signature. So we'll have those images right next to each other and do the comparison there and we'll be able to click good, 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 challenge, challenge, good, good, good. Uh, so it'll make that process a lot easier. Now, once it goes through there, once it's been accepted, then it goes to an opening board. Now the opening board is in charge of removing the ballot and secrecy sleeve from the envelope. The envelopes are stacked in one pile, the secrecy sleeves are in another pile. Once they're done with that batch, they shuffle, just like you would a deck of cards, they're gonna shuffle all those envelopes to put them in a random order and then they remove the ballots from the secrecy sleeve. At this point, there's no way to go from the ballot back to the envelope to see who voted it. And that's how we guarantee your voter secrecy. 
Now, once we have the ballot separated from the secrecy sleeves, then we start opening them and folding them out into a flat, uh, back to a flat piece of paper so we can scan them through the scanners. Uh, once it gets to that point, then it's an on-screen uh, process because it's just taking an image of that ballot um, at that point. So the manual process is actually the removal of the ballot from the envelope and the comparison of the two signatures. Uh, what will voting look like in the near future? Will online voting replace mail-in ballots? I, uh, my comment on that is as long as the Pentagon can be hacked, we will never have online voting. Uh, unfortunately, there, it, it's been proven that there's way too many people out there that want to sabotage elections. <clears throat> and if it was to ever go to an online system, I personally believe that uh, the voters would not accept the results of the election because there would be too much potential for interference. Um, as we saw in the 2016 election um, and even coming up to today, we have hackers knocking on our door every day. The great thing about our systems is we are air gapped. So they can't get into our tabulation systems at all, but we're air gapped, so they can't get we're air gapped, so they can't get into those. Um, but with our voter registration system, we have created the new most secure system in the United States, and we have hackers coming and knocking at our door all the time. We just never open it and let them in. Um, Andrea asks, how do citizens overseas or military vote? Ah, citizens and overseas, overseas citizens and military can be emailed a ballot uh, or they can receive one via mail. Now, citizen, overseas citizens and UACAVA uh, and military voters, uh, they have, they're sent a voter's pamphlet, it's sent out 45 days in advance, their ballot sent out 45 days in advance, and they have a little bit longer period of time to return their ballot. The other part with overseas citizens and military is <clears throat> we count their ballot based off of their signature. So when they sign their ballot is the date that we consider it to be sent back in, where for average citizens like you or me, it has to be postmarked by that day, by election day. Military have to sign it by that day. Now, currently, military and overseas citizens can return their ballot via email. That is not a federal requirement, and it is something that um, – there are certain entities that are trying to remove that ability. And it, the reason they're trying to remove that ability is because of the activity that we have seen with hackers trying to attach trick bots or ransomware to attachments coming into our offices. Um, but every military and overseas citizen voter has the ability right now to email their ballots into us. So this is my question. So is emailing is different than internet? I, I'm kind of confused. Well, you're emailing an image of your ballot. A voting on the oh, internet oh, oh, I see. would be making a selection on screen. And oh. then it would, so what you're doing is you're emailing an image. Now, the downfall with emailing your ballot back into us as an image <clears throat> is the fact that somebody could, te uh, technically, somebody could interrupt that transmission and change it, mm -hmm. change how that image looks. We don't know. And that, that's one of the hardest things about email ballots. Um, we just, you know, if you feel comfortable enough to send it into us, how we get it is how we accept it. 
but we have no way to verify that anything was changed. <clears throat> but just so you know, I mean, we probably only receive on average 10 to 15 email ballots a year. So uh, it's not a huge concern in Grays Harbor. Now, if you were in, uh, say, Pierce County where you have the military base, it might be a little bit more of a concern. Well, I think we've reached the end of the chat questions. Does anybody else have any questions that they didn't put in chat? Yes, Alicia. I think you can unmute yourself. And if not. Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to type this in, but I'll go ahead and ask here. Um, has that Washington ever experienced any massive mail-in voter fraud? No. We have seen minimal voter fraud, uh, and most of it was brought out in the 2016 election. And what it was is somebody that was registered in Washington state and somebody that was registered in Oregon state. I think statewide, I think we found 60 cases where people had voted in two states during a federal election. Um, <clears throat> And what happens with those is those get turned over to the sheriff's office for investigation. If they deem it to be fraudulent, it goes to the prosecutor and then the prosecutor makes the final say of whether they prosecute or not. Uh, but in mass voter fraud, no, we have not seen any. Uh, we've seen small instances um, <clears throat> where a mail ballot carrier might have been handing out election material with the or voting material with the election ballot, which is electioneering, uh, supporting one candidate or another. Uh, those uh, you're usually, the one case that I can think of was up in Clallam County and that person was actually fired from the post office for doing it. Um, but when it comes to vote by mail and voter fraud in Washington state, we have not seen any mass voter fraud issues. Uh, like I said, we only saw like the 60 cases in 2016 <clears throat> and we have a few things in play that prevent it. One, having the state, it only allows one person, one ballot, one vote. Okay. Cause we're able to see that you're not registered in two counties in Washington state. It's all in one system and it's all coming out of one pool. Um, the 60 cases that I know of were sent to the prosecutor's office. Now, I don't know how those played out, uh, but it's very, you know, when you take 60 cases versus 4 million registered voters, it's a very, very small amount. Um, <clears throat> but we also have what they call the ERIC project election research information center um, and what that is is it's a cross-state comparison and every four months three or four months the washington uh, washington state and all the other states that's part of the eric project do a comparison of their voter rolls <clears throat> and what that does is if we see that uh say say myself was registered in grace harbor but I moved to California and registered that cross comparison of states allows us to cancel the oldest registration, which if your newest registration is in California, then you'd be canceled in Grace Harbor. Now that's done every three to four months. And the same situation is done with the social security death index and, and the department of health, the Washington state department of health, every three to four months, we go through all the records, to make sure we're removing everybody that has passed away during that time. Um, hopefully that answers your question. I, I, I think I could probably keep going on, but then it would just be repeating myself. I think. <laughs> no, um, that's, that's very helpful. So um, you're constantly updating the voter polls and, and constantly yes. So we don't have um, grandma who passed away four years ago still continuing to get ballots. Um, the only, that's the only thing. way that that, the only way that that would happen, and it has happened, uh, 
they may still be getting them mailed to somebody's house, but that person is just throwing them in the garbage. And if they're just throwing them in the garbage, well, we don't know that they're not receiving that ballot. And the only way that that would really happen is if the person passed away in another state, uh, because then it wouldn't be necessarily on our Department of Health. And then the Social Security Death Index, I, I only have about a 60% confidence in it uh, because I have in my time, in my 13 years, 13 years of being in office, I have removed people based off the Social Security Death Index that have called me up and said, where's my ballot? Oh. Uh, so, uh, and that's kind of, a, I think that's something that's changing now. Um, what the reason it was happening when I first started was uh, we, I lit, I was in a County that was on a border town to, or close to a border town of uh, Canada. And people that were United States citizens were born in Canada, never issued a birth certificate because they lived right on the border and the hospital was across the border. Oh. And then the other situation was back in the uh, early 1900s, when somebody got married, the, uh, usually the woman did not have a social security number, but the husband did and they utilized the husband's social security number. But when the husband would pass away, maybe we'd get a report from SSDI, social security death index, that the wife passed away when it was actually the husband. Um, now, I believe, you know, with that time frame passing far enough, I don't believe we're going to be seeing much of that anymore. Um, but there is, there is still potential for that. But it's uh, odd. It's very it's odd. There. Yeah. And it's one of those, I mean, we go through one of the things we do at the office is we go through the obituaries every week that are printed in the daily world. I would say the, uh, uh, the Vidette, but Vidette's no longer. Um, but we'd go through the obituaries that were printed in the local newspapers every week to make sure we're catching those as fast as we can. Because me personally, I hate sending a ballot to somebody who just lost a loved one. Uh, that that's really hard on them at that time. And I want to try and prevent it if at all possible. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes, you know, depending on when the passing is and when the ballots go in the mail, sometimes it's just overlapping each other. So for you, what keeps you up at night when it comes down to election time? <laughs> The whole process. <laughs> uh, well, let's see. When was the last time I slept? Um, <laughs> that might be a better question. Uh, you know, election security keeps me up at night. Processing the ballot, finding time and staff to be able to assist with processing. Um, you know, right now, matter of fact, I'm going to go chew somebody out because I'm here at the 28th Street Bridge, and the guy that said he couldn't come help me uh, pick up ballots today is actually out on a boat fishing. <laughs> His truck sitting right over there. Um, you know, with the presidential election right now, the thing that's been keeping me up the most, uh, Thurston County reported 24 hours after the ballot after the ballots hit the mail system, they had 10% of the ballots back in. So what's keeping me awake at night right now is will the ballot boxes be full before I can come get, get them emptied in time. That that's probably one of my biggest concerns and McCleary is one of those because the box is a lot smaller. So it needs to be emptied more often. And so how often are the ballot boxes emptied on average? 
It depends on the election. Uh, special district elections, I'll empty them once a week uh, just because there's a very slow return. The presidential election, I will probably be emptying them every two days, uh, most of them every two to three days. Uh, Aberdeen, Hoquiam, I'll probably have to empty at least once a day starting mm-hmm. starting uh, this Saturday, I, I will start emptying them. Are you the one that has to empty them or is it a, a group of people? It has to be a minimum of two people. You have to have two people there uh, when you're accessing ballots. Now, once they are secured, it only requires one person to transport the ballots, but they have to be in a secured container with two witnesses um, but what I have set up in Grace Harbor County, it's, it's to cost savings for the districts and everything, is I find volunteers. So I have a volunteer that goes around with me and picks up the ballots um, every time I go out, who is the one sitting out fishing right now. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and then I have a volunteer in each community that secures the ballot boxes at 8 p.m. on election night, which since I got a few people on here, I'm looking for volunteers in Causey, McCleary. Um, But uh, um, so I try to find volunteers that are civic minded uh, to try and help kind of alleviate some of the costs that get sent back to the districts because everything we do whoever's on the ballot is who pays for it. So next year, next year, when we start producing voter pamphlets, you know, the school districts, the fire districts are going to see a huge increase in their cost of elections to run an election because we're required to produce a voter's pamphlet and the state will not be be paying for the prepaid postage it'll be sent back to the districts. Oh, wow. So it's gonna, the prepaid postage in the voters pamphlet is gonna hit our junior districts in Grays Harbor County immensely. Yeah. And it's a big concern on my plate. That's one of the things that probably keeps me up at night is worrying that a junior district isn't gonna be able to afford the cost of election and has to dissolve because they can't run without, you know, running levies, running bonds, or having uh, their commissioners or their chairs on the ballot. Mm -hmm. And they can't afford to pay it. Which then it goes back to the taxpayers. So so like um, the city elections, would they then, say a mayor race, would they then have to be paying for their information and their yep. part of the election. So, so if I were to take McCleary as an example, when the mayor and the city council appear on the ballot, mm-hmm. they are responsible for their portion of the election cost for that election. Wow. <clears throat> so in the primary, if we run a primary election, and let's just say McCleary has three candidates running for office, which forces us to run a primary. If there's only two, because it's a nonpartisan, they don't have to have a primary. But if we had three candidates and it requires a primary, and let's say that's the only district in the whole county that is running, they are responsible solely for the whole cost of the election. Now, if McCleary, Aberdeen, Elma, Causey all have mayoral races in the primary, they will split the cost based off of registered voters. That's some news I didn't know. (laughs) A a lot of people don't. And, um, you know, when we when we were at legislation about it, I mean, I believe that we should be sending out voter pamphlets to everybody. I do believe that. But I also think we need to find a different funding source 
because right now the way it's set up is each of the districts are responsible to pay for their cost of the election because we are just running the election for those districts. And when those districts, if you take a cemetery district or a Dykin and drainage district, a lot of them do not have funds in a bank account. I have seen where the board has personally donated to their district to pay for their cost of the election. Yeah. And most of those districts are non-paid boards. So they're, they're taken from their personal pockets to pay for the district in the uh, cemetery uh, election. So that just makes it more important to vote, to keep voting, <laughs> so. Yeah. It does. You know, and I always say, you know, one of the biggest things I always say is it's it's not the presidential election that affects us the most. It's the local elections that affect us the most, because they're what the local election is what affects our taxes, affects our kids and our schools. It affects how we live in our communities and everything from your city council, your mayor, your commissioner all the way up to your legislator and congressional congressional races they're what makes the decisions on what taxes we pay how we live our lives in these communities and if you don't get out and vote then we have no way to really fight for what we want very true um something i used to always say now this will be not the norm for this year for this presidential year but on average 50 percent of the registered voters actually vote on average and if you look at 50 percent of the population is registered to vote which in turn means 25 percent of the of the population determines how we live our lives in our communities. One out of every four people makes that decision. So the more voter turnout we have, the more say you have in how you live your life. Wow, very true. I don't know if there'd be more questions after that. That was like a really good way to end it, but does anybody have any more questions? <laughs> Uh, Chris Miller, you just joined us. Do you have anything you would like to ask? No, sorry I'm late. I, I had trouble getting in. So that's okay. We hopefully videotaped it. I did miss my introduction, which was um, astounding uh, piece of drama that you will not get to see. Uh, but we did record it, so Chris, you can watch it once we get it uploaded to YouTube. Um, oh, thank you. Perfect. Uh, can I ask that you send me a link to this too, and I'll put it on our Facebook? Oh, yes, yes, most definitely. Um, I think this is all valid information um, and useful information that I feel like everybody should sit and watch this so they know what is going on. Um, and I learned quite a bit, and I've always been a voter, so I'm, I'm pretty. <laughs> the, one thing I, the one thing I will leave. Uh, uh, in this with is the auditor's office and ballot processing is an open public process. Uh, we have our elections facility, which is located just behind the sheriff's office. And anybody, no matter whether they're a candidate or if they're a political part of a political party can come and observe the process. We have a, per a nice uh, small waiting room um, and you can stand at the windows and you can see the signature verification going on. You can see the ballot sorter and the tabulation uh, system running all from one area. Wow. Yeah. And well, I, re that's a great I recommend anybody that is interested in learning the process, come to the office and see it. That is very fascinating. So I have a group of young people. Can I organize a time for them to come and watch the process? I would appreciate it if you'd coordinate that with me since you have a group of them, but yes, 
And if, if I have a coordinated effort, official political party observers are actually allowed into the processing room. Uh, and it's something like this, I would actually try to coordinate an effort to where I could walk them through the room and they could see all the system up close. Now with social distancing and everything, we still have to be careful on that, but we can take them over. And um, usually earlier in the day is better for that process. Uh, you know, 10, 10, to, 10 to two, I would say would be the best window. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> because once ballots come in in the mail and stuff, that's when we start and that's not until about 10 o'clock, so. Okay. Could I get your phone number? I, I can pass it to you, Alicia, I have it. Okay. All right. Thank you. So it, it's on my website also. The, the okay. cell phone, this cell phone number is on the website along with my direct line to the office. But obviously the cell phone is the easiest to get a hold of me because I'm <laughs> out on the road a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Wow. This has just been super informative. I want to thank Andrea once again for arranging this and for Joe for taking precious time away from what you're doing to uh, share with us today. No, it's perfect. I appreciate you guys having me here today. Yeah. It's been awesome. Yeah, I wish I wish we would have done this two years ago, <laughs> four years ago. <laughs> Yay pandemic for making this happen. <laughs> anytime, anytime. I do a lot of public speaking, so anytime you need it. Uh, if we ever get back to the non-social distancing requirement, it is even better. Yes, yes, most definitely, most definitely. All right, does anybody, I never know how to end this. Anybody have anything else? Any comments? No? Well, thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Everybody take thank care. <laughs> All right, thank you. You have a great day. Thanks. All right, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.